Hello, welcome to Red Red. Today I'm talking about The Master and Margarita, the first book from Mikhail Bulgakov that I've read, and I think it's probably fair to say that it's his most popular work, right? It's, it's the one that I've seen uh, the most at least. Uh, however, I am also interested in reading The Heart of a Dog, which is kind of mentioned uh, here and there. But yeah, I'll jump into my uh, main thoughts about The Master and Margarita and my takeaways from the book, but, but I'm kind of conflicted on this book. It's not that I ever didn't enjoy it, and it was fun from like page one to the end, and I had a really good time reading it, but there's... it was a bit kind of ephemeral, and it was not like there's anything that's really stuck with me from the book, so maybe that's because we've been so set uh, because of the amount of time that's passed since the book, we've been so saturated by surrealism that it doesn't sort of... Uh, that it, it's a bit par for the course at this point, but... Also, the main things, I'll talk about the things that I really enjoyed about this book. Uh, there's one really salient thing that I just loved, uh, but and everything else that I felt not let down by, but like appointed by, like, like not disappointed, just appointed. And I know that's not the right word, but you know what I mean. Um, it was just, I, I felt like I, I hadn't changed or grown or developed as a person by the time I got to the end of this book. Uh, and I don't know if that's... Um, that feels like a like a really scathing criticism, actually. Uh, but anyway, really quick refresher on plot for people who have forgotten or for people who don't care about spoilers. The Master and Margarita is basically the story of the devil, who in this uh, book is called Voland, showing up in Moscow and just causing a row. He's having a he's having a, a ball of a time. Uh, he actually has a ball uh, now that I realized. So we get introduced to the devil from uh, Bestomi, or Ivan, his first name is referred to, or and Berlioz, who is not the composer. And I like that as well. That's a funny thing, is that a lot of composer names are used in this, like Stravinsky and uh, Rimsky, uh, which I guess is sort of like rimsky Koskov. But yeah, they get introduced. They're hanging out. They're just chilling. They're talking about... Uh, they're talking about the fact that religion is a farce and that it's not real and this guy over here is I mean is like wait a minute no I can prove that religion's real and it turns out he's the devil he predicts that Berlioz is going to die he's going to be murdered by a woman and he's going to be beheaded and then um, the end of the chapter uh, or the end of the two chapters later uh, it, the prediction comes true Berlioz kind of slips on some sunflower oil that uh, a woman named Anna spilled and she actually does come into the book later on and he falls onto a tram a bit you know uh, uh, and then he's he's decapitated and uh, hijinks hijinks ensue from there uh, the devil puts on a black magic show where he invites all of the people to Moscow and he has these tricks where he just makes money appear and it starts fluttering down and everyone's grabbing their money and uh, then he also invites uh, the women on stage to go and get these like dresses and these jewels and whatnot and they all dress themselves up and, and feet feet wear shoes that's what they're called uh they, they all get dressed up for free and then but then of course because because mischief managed uh they when they leave the theater the next day it turns out that the, the cash is actually not real it's not real money um the clothes just disappear and so there's a bunch of women walking around like nearly naked on the street and just in their underwear and uh yeah to bring it back to the title Pretty much halfway through the book, you realize that the master is a man who, an author who wrote a manuscript on Pontius Pilate, who is the the uh, procurator who convicted Yeshua in, to uh, to be crucified. And yes, Yeshua is like very obviously Jesus, and and you know there's Matthew the Levite is in it, and Judas the one who the one who betrayed Yeshua. Uh, but I think that it's sort of it's intentionally not that he intentionally doesn't use Jesus because he does like to make some uh, affordances and changes to it and some uh, some interesting ones you know uh, but I'll get to that uh, so the master but he wrote a uh, he wrote a story on this on this character Pontius Pilate and it eventually get burned but alas manuscripts don't burn and uh, the devil W uh, was able to sort of retrieve it and give it back to him, but only through the help of Margarita, who is basically the MVP. She comes through and just uh, she comes through and just saves the day. And the whole like second half of the book is just how much of of a boss bitch she is. So yeah, uh, that's that's the main story. And in the end, they um, they just 
it's it's like a happily ever after story really it's, it's kind of cool and so that's basic plot i'm going to talk about uh the surrealism because this book is often described as a magical realism book i would say it's a magical surrealism book because the magic and the and all of that is very explicit it's and it's very clear and to kind of describe what i mean by clear it's very dully and maybe and maybe this is just a fault again uh, like i said of how much we've been exposed to surrealism but i feel like when i look at someone like dali versus someone like max ernst there's there's something that's different and i didn't know what that difference was but it's a clarity that was best described i think by william h gas in uh when he's talking about of all people Immanuel kant so He's talking about Kant's, uh, the critiques, the critiques of um, pure reason, the critiques of judgment, but in this sentence he's just talking about all three. The three critiques, among many large things, do an important small one. They render the difference between the sort of thought and writing which is inherently and necessarily hard, and the kind, like Heidegger's, which forms a soft metaphysical fog around even the easiest and most evident idea. And it's that metaphysical fog that is missing from this whole book, with maybe the exception of chapter 5, The Affair at uh, Griboyedov. Let me just confirm. Griboyedov. Um, that's how it's spelled, and that's me just trying to sort of wing the pronunciation. Um, every All of the surrealism is pristine, and it's not that, like... Uh, it's not incomprehensible. It's absurd, but it's not incomprehensible. And... So, in that sense, I have a really hard time describing any of the book as particularly dreamlike, because that's not really how I dream. And to give an example of a prose that more al that aligns a bit more closely with my concept of dreaming, we're going to re re return to the big GR uh, from a little bit later, uh, quite a bit later in the book, actually. Yes, yes, all staring at him. But then why keep saying mind and body? Why make that distinction? Because it's hard to get over the wonder of finding that Earth is a living critter after all these years of thinking about a big dumb rock to find a body and psyche. He feels like a child again. He knows that in theory he must not attach himself, but he still is in love with, it, with his sense of wonder, with having found it again, even this late, even knowing he must soon let it go, to find that gravity... Uh, taken so for granted is really something eerie, messianic, extrasensory in Earth's mind-body, having hugged to its holy center the wastes of dead species, gathered, packed, transmuted, realigned, and woven molecules to be taken up again by the Coltar Kabbalists of the other side, the ones bland on his voyages, uh, bland's the person's name, by the way, the ones bland on his voyages has noted, taken, boiled off, teased apart, explicated to every last permutation of useful magic, centuries past exhaustion, still finding new molecular pieces, combining and recombining them into new synthetics. Forget them, they are no better than the clip clipoth, the shells of the dead. You must not waste your time with them. And that last uh, part was a quote. And that is just... I know it's a different pro style and it's it's totally fair that my conception of dreamlike is just beat writing and, and that sort of and and part of, intrinsically linked to the sentence structure but in the absence of that I found it very hard to not take all of the absurdism literally like there was not uh, there was not a whole lot of ambiguity it was just like yes the devil is actually literally here literally doing this and all of these people are literally experiencing it it's it's clear it's pristine that's probably the main reason why i uh, why i felt it was a bit uh, not too expedient's not the right word but it's not like it, it's not as lasting uh, for me. But the main thing that I really liked, and I already sort of alluded to this with Margarita, is that one of the things I love about this book is how much is, is female autonomy and how much really the world just goes around and, and plot points progress uh, because of because of, of women. So yes, the master is, is the master. He's the one who's written this great work, but after it gets burned, he's just sort of sad and moping and he's just like 
kind of annoying to be around but then margarita comes in and she's just like yeah i'm going to you know i'm going to agree to be the devil's consort at his at his ball and i'm going to greet all of these people and i'm going to suffer through like burning and like just standing for ages like everyone all of the guests at the devil's ball come up and kiss her on like on the foot or on the knees and every kiss is like fire and by the end it's just burning and yeah and, and but that's just also um, and it uh, so aside from that uh, there's also Natasha Margarita's servant who is sort of liberated and she's kind of given the opportunity to uh, like dominate really more or less dominate this uh, this neighbor um, Anna the woman who spilled the sunflower oil is really the one who caused the inciting incident and then there's also the fact that the tram driver was a woman as well because Berlioz was prophesied to be uh, uh, beheaded by a woman and uh, yeah I'm trying to think of some others I guess you can also make a, a statement that Bulgakov is very very comfortable with talking about nudity and uh, Hella one of the uh, one of Voland or the devil's consorts or, or like friends uh, like entourage I guess is just a completely nude woman who's who wears nothing but an apron uh, and it's a great source of embarrassment for a lot of the a lot of the more shrewd guys so there is this great sense of female liberation that's showing up in the book and and so that was awesome and that's one of the that's probably the only standout thing that I'll get from it I feel like I've gotten intense surrealism from other places but also surrealism has sort of evolved and developed so it's it's not again it's not a fair comparison that because this book was written in the mid 40s but because of because of uh, miscellaneous events it really wasn't uh, revived or published until the 70s but yeah honestly those are my main thoughts of the master and margarita i might just skip through and and find see if i can find some uh, uh, extracts or passages that i enjoyed here's a here's an interesting uh, bit of surrealism a bit closer a uh, with to that fog that metaphysical fog idea this is the dr stravinsky uh when when ivan is in he's taken to the hospital after being more or less traumatized by by seeing his mate uh berlioz be murdered and trying to catch the devil and and just not working do you hear stravinsky suddenly asked seizing ivan nikolai nikolaich nikolaich by both hands as he held them in his own he stared intently into ivan's eyes repeating we shall help you do you hear we shall help you. You'll be able to relax. It's quiet here. Everything's going to be all right. All right. We shall help you. And just this, re yeah. That was a that was that was a great passage that I that I outlined. A fun back and forth. The first time when you when we meet the Mar uh, when we meet meet the master, uh, he's talking to Ivan in the hospital. They're sharing adjacent rooms, and uh, uh, he says. He's talking about the fact that he hasn't read any of Ivan's poetry, but he's saying that it's bad. And uh, he's saying, I've never read any of your poetry, uh, says the visitor or, or the master. Then how can you say that? Why shouldn't I? I've read plenty of other poetry. I don't suppose by some miracle that yours is any better, but I'm ready to take it on trust. Is your poetry good? Stupendous, says, uh, said Ivan boldly. Don't write anymore, said the visitor imploringly. I promise not to," said Ivan solemnly. <laughs> As they sealed the vow with a handshake, soft footsteps and the voices could be heard from the corridor. And it just goes on. It's just a funny. Uh, there is some funny dialogue in this. That uh, definitely, like, the, like I said, the book is funny the whole way through. But um, just maybe not. Maybe not one of those lasting books that comes back to you in a, in a fit or, or just like uh, springs back into your mind randomly and thinking like, whoa, whoa. Like, I feel like I've learned a lot about the world. Uh, because of reading this book like the book is very much very much obviously the brainchild of a man who lived through very real oppression and, and suppression but his way of mitigating it or making it okay was to write a story about the devil showing up and fixing everything and so it it felt somewhat trivialized well, it's it's not trivialized because he really he really experienced it but i don't i didn't feel that depth i felt the humor of it um so yeah that was my main takeaway i guess uh, and that was all oh, that was my main impression from the book really my main takeaway was again the the feminine authority uh, or autonomy uh, and autonomy as well but yeah let me know what you thought of master and margarita i know this book it can be pretty beloved uh, uh, beloved but yeah for me it was 
just a fun ride. It was it was just a fun read uh, that I don't regret, but I'll probably not read again. So yeah. Uh, in any case, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.